Well, I now have the pleasure, friends, of introducing to you uh, a man who's come to be a very dear friend of mine, one whom I greatly admire and respect, Ludwig Tumann. Uh, in addition to his work as a writer, Ludwig is by profession a composer, pianist, music educator, and producer. As a composer, Ludwig has written for varied media, including orchestra, chorus, chamber, and solo. He studied composition and liberal arts at Harvard University, where he graduated with honors. He continued his musical studies at UC Berkeley and under the composer Roger Nixon at San Francisco State University. His study of the piano was under the internationally recognized artists Adolf Baller, who toured worldwide with violinist Yehudi Menuhin, and under Esteban Nados, himself a prized piano pupil of Barton. Ludwig has been a faculty member of the Chicago Conservatory College, where he designed and taught courses in composition, theory, and non-Western music. His works range widely in style, from Renaissance choral pieces to ragtime, to songs inspired by elements of traditional music from various continents. His compositions have been presented in several television and radio broadcasts, as well as in venues in the UK, California, Illinois, Massachusetts, Florida, and Venezuela. And in the latter country, he spent many years as a pioneer and served on the auxiliary board. Today, he will begin by performing for us an original work for piano, and immediately afterward, will share with us reflections on the numerous ways that the arts can contribute to the process of community building. Friends, please join me in welcoming Ludwig Tumann. Again, friends. <laughs> now it's my privilege to share with you some thoughts, some observations on the theme of the arts and how they can contribute to the process of community building. You might be wondering if there's a connection between that theme and the piano composition we just heard. Well, I would say yes to a certain extent. The music was suitable, I think, for a gathering such as this conference. And it might be appropriate for certain kinds of outreach activities to which the general public would be invited. But the piece we heard was fairly long and complex, so it would not lend itself to be used in most community activities. Certainly not in most children's classes. <laughs> <laughs> so it was probably not typical of most of the contributions the arts can make to community building. What I have in mind when referring to contributions of the arts involves, in the vast majority of cases, artworks produced by people who do not practice an art form for a living. They are far more likely to be arts enthusiasts, amateurs or students, developing their talents and offering their services to the community. At this stage in the Baha'i community's development, professional artists are not abundant. But there is an abundance of individuals with artistic gifts, 
that are waiting to be discovered, tapped, and developed. And personally, I feel that making use of such talents is a key part of raising human resources in the arts. The variety of activities for which such individuals <clears throat> have already begun to offer their services include devotional gatherings, study circles, activities for children and youth, feasts and holy days. Moreover, with the new five-year plan calling upon us to give more attention to outreach through social discourse and social action, this is another area where the arts can make a contribution. To get a better feel for the potential of the arts to contribute to community life, it might be helpful to consider the extent to which we are already influenced by them. The potential of the arts is far-reaching. They have the ability to attract and edify, to broaden vision, to touch the heart, to strengthen divine morality, to spiritualize the sentiments and galvanize the will of humanity. They can interact with and support virtually every facet of social and economic development. The arts touch our lives in countless ways. When used appropriately, they can uplift and inform, lighten our burdens, and be a source of comfort and tranquility for, for troubled souls. Beyond this, the arts throughout the world have always helped to shape and reinforce a people's identity, to transmit an outlook on life and its associated beliefs and values from one generation to the next. Their influence is impossible to calculate. Further still, when we consider the wondrous vision of the arts that shimmers in the Baha'i writings, when we consider their elevated role, we find the most compelling reasons to make an effort to appreciate the spiritual nature of art's essence and to better grasp the magnitude of the service it can render. For, from various sources quoted in the compilation on the arts, we learned that arts and sciences generally should, quote, result in advantage to man, ensure his progress, and elevate his rank. That music is a ladder for our souls, a means whereby they may be lifted up unto the realm on high. That the art of drama will become a great educational power. That when a painter takes up her paintbrush, it is as if she were at prayer in the temple that the arts fulfill their highest purpose when showing forth the praise of God, and that music, art, and literature are to represent and inspire the noblest sentiments and highest aspirations. The arts have always played a major role in the life of individuals and communities. Our human environment is filled with a variety of art forms to such an extent that we may take them for granted and not even notice them. See the lamps above, the design on them? See the pattern on the rug below? Without touches like this, we would be sitting in a bare box. You know? Every building we step into, every piece of furniture, every device, painting, carpet, piece of music, and novel that we interact with had its beginning as an idea in the head and heart of an artist. The combined effect of all such art forms is to create an environment in which we are immersed practically all our lives. This environment is physical, intellectual, and spiritual at the same time, and it affects us in many ways, both obvious and subtle, influencing our perceptions, our emotional state, our attitudes, and indirectly, our values. Whether we are aware of it or not, we are surrounded by the arts every day, from morning to night, from birth to death. Now, before we go on, I'd like to offer a few slides that make the point about the influence of the arts in a rather graphic way. Here is a picture of Mount Carmel in the early 20th century, about 100 years ago. Let's just consider for a moment. If there were no such thing as architecture, landscape design, 
and related art forms, Mount Carmel would still look this way today and would continue looking the same indefinitely into the future. It would still be a holy mountain, of course, and it would remain in a state of natural beauty. But it would not be able to reflect through the arts humanity's sense of beauty, awe, and reverence in the presence of the beauty of God. But fortunately, such art forms do exist. And when they are masterfully applied by artists such as Hand of the Cause, William Sutherland Maxwell, who designed the superstructure of the Shrine of the Bab, and Hossein Amanat, who designed the seat of the Universal House of Justice and other major structures on the Ark of Mount Carmel, and Faribar Sahba, who both designed the terraces and served as project manager to raise the remaining buildings of the World Center on the Ark. Then, the result is this. And here it seems a brief digression would be in order. You know, it's not every day that a talk about the arts that includes a reference just to the terraces of the Mount Carmel has within its audience an artist who has given the world gifts of this magnitude. It's true that there were many hearts and hands involved in the great undertaking of bringing the terraces into being, but the primary artistic inspiration had to flow through someone's mind and to become materialized through his tireless efforts. So, Mr. Sahba, as we remember the terraces and the house of worship in India and other gifts we have received from you, please allow me to say on behalf of all of us and from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. So now, returning to our main theme, the integration of the arts into the process of community building. For the remainder of the talk, I'm going to be focusing on a more limited group of arts of the kind that particularly lend themselves to involvement in community activities. Primarily, but not exclusively, I have in mind the performing arts, such as music, theater, and dance, literature, such as storytelling and poetry, and visual arts, such as painting, calligraphy, photography, and computer-aided graphics, and including weaving, embroidery, quilt making, banners, and other crafts, which, like painting, produce an image on a two-dimensional surface. The theme of integrating the arts into community life, I believe, is vitally important not only to those of us who already have an interest in the arts, but to the community as a whole. This is because artworks, when informed and inspired by the divine teachings, can reinforce and amplify their effect, thereby helping to move the hearts and ennoble the conscience of humanity. The arts are thus capable of significantly enhancing our advancement toward the community's developmental aims, which are outlined in the new five-year plan. But to have this effect, the arts would need to become more fully integrated into core community activities. A fuller integration of the arts can come about, I believe, only if certain limiting habits of thought regarding the arts are overcome, only if the spiritual nature and social dynamics of the arts are better understood <clears throat> in the light of Baha'i teachings, and only if the community systematically channels the vitality of the arts into its activities. Throughout history, the arts have contributed to the development of society, not through the efforts of artists alone, but through the collaboration between them and a receptive, sensitized, and informed community. And that is why it is a matter that concerns us all. Friends, in order to get some perspective on this subject, I think it would be helpful to place my remarks in a broad context, that of the worldwide development of the Baha'i community. From messages of the Universal House of Justice addressed to the Baha'i world, it's clear that the community is entering a very significant stage in its long-term development. And the multiple ways that the arts can now contribute has everything to do with this juncture where we presently stand. The House of Justice has drawn our attention to some of the characteristics of this stage, 
such as the culture of learning, which has taken root in the community, the systematization of the community's growth and consolidation, the growing diversity and complexity of, in of institutions that make up the administrative order, and increasingly, our outreach and interaction with the larger society. <clears throat> to see this development from a long-term perspective, it's helpful to use an analogy employed by Shoghi Effendi, who wrote that the divine order Baha'u'llah is bringing into being is in an embryonic stage. Picking up on his analogy of the embryo, perhaps we could compare the early evolution of the faith to an embryo's development within the womb. We might compare the administrative order to the central nervous system, which along with the child's defenses is the first system that an embryo needs to develop. And the path leading toward a world order is perhaps analogous to the next stage in the embryo's growth, where the nervous system continues to develop and the vital organs are beginning to take shape. That is the stage, it seems, that the Baha'i world community is now entering. Through most of the 20th century, the focus was necessarily on building the administrative order, the embryo's nervous system. And now that the basic structure of the administrative order is in place, it's time for the embryo, perhaps, to begin building and developing its body and its divine, uh, its vital organs. This development of body and organs is partly reflected in new institutions and processes that have been emerging, such as regional Baha'i councils, regional training institutes, clusters, and the entire institute process. But it is also reflected in the emphasis that the new five-year plan places on less tangible goods, the quality of Baha'i community life, the ennoblement of human relationships at the level of individuals, institutions, and community, and the penetration of divine teachings into society to begin gradually transforming it into a new civilization. In all these areas, the arts have much to offer. In fact, the arts are sure to become deeply and directly involved with the building of the new civilization. It has become clear that the institute process and other modes of learning that the Baha'i community is now engaged in worldwide are intended not only to spiritualize the community's size, but also to establish the roots of the new divine civilization Baha'u'llah founded through his teachings. The characteristics of that civilization will gradually emerge as the teachings are carried into action, thereby, thereby transforming the lives of individual believers along with the life of the Baha'i community, and beyond that, eventually, the life of society as a whole. Across history, each of the manifestations of God, including Moses, the Buddha, Jesus Christ, and Muhammad, released into the world energies that crystallized into a new civilization. And it is important, I think, to note that in the building of each of these civilizations, the arts played a vital role. When we look at the examples provided by history, we find that the period of transition to a new civilization, the period when the embryo's body and organs are beginning to develop, is precisely when the arts begin to play a key role, promoting that civilization's highest interests and giving visible expression to its ideals. Now, to some extent, what I'm saying is nothing new. Thanks to the encouragement that the Universal House of Justice has given over the years to involve the arts in Baha'i activities, and with the resulting initial efforts made by the Friends, I think it's fair to say that overall, the Baha'i community is coming to recognize that to include the arts in community life is beneficial. There are indications, however, that in the community there is perhaps still a widespread sense that the use of the arts is a non-essential activity, that the arts are somehow removed 
from the central priorities of the faith. In a previous stage of our development, when the central priority of the world community was to build the administrative order, perhaps the arts were non-essential and tangential at that time. And perhaps the less than congenial attitude toward the arts that one can still find among some members of the community is a vestige perhaps of that earlier stage in our development. It's an attitude that basically says music, skits, stories, and the like are nice to have. They're a pleasant addition, but we can do without them. In the new stage uh, that the Baha'i community is entering, though, I would like to suggest that the arts will be capable of contributing greatly and in many ways. Every time the community's development arrives at a new stage, there are some habits of thought that need to be examined, some attitudes that need to be adjusted. And regarding the arts, if some adjustments were called for by our new stage of development, I would suggest that it is the need to move beyond the limited view of the arts as merely a pleasant but non-essential activity. For only when this view has been replaced by a more positive perspective will the arts have full scope to infuse their inherent vitality into the community's spiritual life and into its outreach to society. Described in the simplest terms, the effect we could anticipate from giving more attention to the integration of the arts is this. All activities in which the Baha'i community is involved, we could expect to see become significantly more spiritual, more attractive, more dynamic, and more effective. Let's take a look at some of the reasons why the arts can claim to possess such extraordinary potential and how they influence the human mind and heart. To begin, let's consider two statements from Abdul Baha about music. On one occasion, he said, music is an important means to the education and development of humanity. But the only true way is through the teachings of God. Music, he said, is like this glass. And the teachings of God, the utterances of God, are like the water. When the glass or chalice is absolutely pure and clear, and the water is perfectly fresh and limpid, then it will confer life. On another occasion, he wrote, Thank thou God that thou art instructed in music and melody, singing with pleasant voice the glorification and praise of the eternal, the living. I pray to God that thou mayest employ this talent in prayer and supplication, in order that the souls may become quickened, the hearts may become attracted, and all may become inflamed with the fire of the love of God. Note that music alone would not be able to produce the effects mentioned by Abdul Baha. But when music is combined appropriately with the sacred word, the combination can cause the hearts to become inflamed with the fire of the love of God, in Abdul Baha's words. We might almost say then that one of the powers of the word of God is that it's like a fuel that propels the divine cause, and that the arts, when added to that fuel, can assist it to release more of its inherent energy. The next point to which I'd like to invite your attention is that the arts are incredibly adaptable. Though the arts could never substitute for any of the current core activities, they nonetheless can be molded to accompany and invigorate such activities and can infuse them with additional spiritual potency. And they can do this in ways that are appropriate for any culture and for any age group. This allows the arts to serve universally as a kind of force multiplier, if you will. It's an ability unique among humanity's many vocations. Let's consider for a moment. 
As essential as medicine is for humanity's well-being, does it lend itself to being regularly practiced in the context of children's classes? As indispensable as engineering is, does it lend itself to become an integral part of devotional programs? Or trade and finance in study circles? The arts may not be inherently concerned with children's classes or study circles any more than other professions are, but one thing that all the arts we are talking about have in common is the ability to address themselves to humanity's spiritual life. Because of that, they can be adapted to all such core activities and in the process can increase their effect. For some examples of how the arts can contribute to community building, let's look at some slides of artistic activities. One area where the arts can be integrated is devotionals, feasts, and holy days. When adequately employed, the ability of the arts to touch the heart can make such events more inspiring. For instance, here we see a group in Coquitlam, British Columbia, who brought the arts into play for their observance of Rizvan by creating an interpretation of the garden of Rizvan in a home. Before guests entered, some rose water was put on their hands and they were given a selection from the sacred writings. The arts also have the ability to simultaneously engage multiple regions of the human brain. Therefore, their use can make the learning process in children's classes far more effective. Here we see a dramatic enactment by children in Apple Valley, Minnesota, recalling the letters of the living and their search for the promised one. And as you can see, there are creative ways of conjuring up a 19th century robe and turban. On the other hand, the art's ability to strengthen bonds of friendship, group identity, and social cohesion makes activities for youth and junior youth far more appealing. Here we see a youth activity involving music and singing in Mendota Heights, Minnesota. And here, junior youth performing an Indian drum song at the Brighton Creek Conference Center in Washington. What's more, the art's expression of beauty through the senses, in design, light, color, sound, and motion, can also make activities of outreach to friends and neighbors far more attractive. In this connection, it's helpful to keep in mind that the arts do more than simply affect our feelings. Rather, they engage our minds as well as our hearts. This is one reason the arts are so potent. In its letter of December 27, 2005, to the Continental Conference of the Continental Boards of Counselors, the Universal House of Justice observed that the arts can enhance a surge of energy that mobilizes the believers. This stems not only from the ability of the arts to stir the emotions, but also from their capacity to be instrumental in the process of learning. Whenever Baha'i communities bring into play art that embodies or reflects the divine teachings in some way, the artwork's educational and edifying influence will be felt not only in study circles, but equally in other regular activities of community life not normally associated with learning, such as devotionals, feasts, and holy day observances. Now let's briefly consider how the arts can contribute to social discourse and programs of social action. The natural ability of the arts, particularly performance arts, to reach out, touch the hearts of inquirers, capture the imagination of the public, and galvanize its will, allows them to play a key role as a bridge between the Baha'i community and society at large. For example, imagine a proposed program to plant trees within a village or within a high-density urban neighborhood. To gain local support, the program could be easily and effectively promoted to the residents of the area through storytelling and songs about nature, 
skits about climate change, or paintings portraying the residential area as it would look after the trees were planted. Building the, com the Baha'i community not only entails growth in size, resources, and outreach, but it also involves uplifting the spiritual quality of life. The significance of the arts, like that of the core activities, is not limited to their ability to directly promote growth in numbers. They are also important for their ability to uplift and enrich the spiritual facets of individual and community life as a fundamental aspect of the new civilization. Further still, the arts can also elevate the quality of a community's life on the social level. To mention one of the many ways they do this, the arts can powerfully reinforce the sense of belonging, the sense of common identity and Baha'i identity shared by members of a given community. This is especially the case when the arts involve participation in a group, singing together, dancing together, or making a theatrical presentation together. A special area in which the arts affect the quality of life concerns beauty. It's true that the arts can be of great practical value to the cause of human unity at this time by proclaiming the divine message, helping to accelerate the advance of clusters, increasing the effectiveness of core activities, attracting, education, uh, educating, and galvanizing the will of large numbers of believers and inquirers. But transcending all such considerations, the arts can also play a unique role in human life by satisfying our innate hunger for beauty. This hunger is closely related to the appetite and search for spiritual truth. In fact, perhaps the two could be regarded as two sides of the same coin. The God-given capacity for attraction to beauty and attraction to divine truth is one of the most distinctive powers of the human soul. And by developing this capacity, arts that serve the spiritual aims of religion can increase our attraction to the beauty of God and thereby help fulfill the very purpose of our existence, which the sacred writings tell us is to know, love, and worship our Creator. Today, humanity's hunger for beauty is mounting as beauty in the human world becomes harder to find. On all sides, one is accosted by ugliness in its many forms, moral degradation, greed and callousness in the financial world, environmental destruction, the violence and abuse regularly portrayed in news and entertainment, and a decline of civilization generally. In such a world, when our friends and neighbors find a setting where uplifting beauty is presented to them through the arts, it is as though they have stepped into an oasis in the desert or set foot in the enchantment of a national park. Further still, there is something about beauty that is central to religion. For beauty touches the very roots of human motivation. In the final analysis, what is it that motivates a human being to make efforts to translate the teachings of God into reality? Is it fear of divine punishment? Is it hope for a reward? Baha'u'llah calls us to a more elevated kind of motivation. In the Kitab i Akdas, he writes, Observe my commandments for the love of my beauty. So when the beauty expressed in an artwork is associated with divine qualities, when it becomes a reflection of the beauty of the creative word of God, then it stirs within our hearts a love 
for the beauty of God, and the effect is light upon light. There is no way to measure the value of such a spiritual and artistic experience. Friends, we've been considering a wide range of potential benefits the arts can provide. And to close, I'd like to observe that for this potential to be realized, the Baha'i community needs to have a systematic way to develop human resources in the arts, to spiritualize the community's understanding of the nature of the arts, and to gain skills in their application at the grassroots level. A resource that could be of help in this regard is presently under development. It's a course called Tapping into the Spiritual Power of the Arts and is intended for the general public rather than solely for artists. It's designed to help lay a foundation for the integration of the arts into all aspects of Baha'i community life. The course is currently entering its fourth year of development and is sponsored by the Wings to the Spirit Foundation a Baha'i-inspired nonprofit organization based in Gulf Breeze, Florida. The course is being developed and refined at the grassroots through the evaluations of a growing body of volunteer participants in multiple countries. For those who are interested in learning about it, I'll be describing the project to develop this course this afternoon as one among the many attractive offerings in the breakout sessions. Thank you very much.